Thank you, and once again, uh, good morning, and welcome to the King James Bible Baptist Church, uh, currently in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, by the way, uh, I say currently in Gainesville, Florida, because we might move. We, Lord willing, will move, um, but we're taking the church with us, amen. Um, 1 Corinthians, turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, we're going to read verses 3 through 16, and then open in a word of prayer, uh, starting in verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. If you're going to have short hair, you might as well shave it, because it's the same thing, he says. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. So if you're not going to if you're not going to have long hair, or you're not going to wear a hat uh, when you pray, then we're going to shave your head for you. How's that? So you can be ashamed. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Remember, uh, that's a reference to Genesis chapter chapter uh, 2 when God formed man of the dust of the ground and he formed woman not of the ground but of man he took out the rib and used it to form a woman verse 9 neither was the man created for the woman but the woman for the man he didn't say to the woman well it seems like you need some help let me get you a man he didn't say to the woman it, it seems like uh you need someone uh, to to uh, do your laundry for you. Uh, let me get you a man to do it for you, or to help you with it. He he made the woman to help the man. He didn't say to the woman, uh, "You need to help meat for you. Here's a man." That's not what he said. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. We'll get to that this morning, Lord willing. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So it's true that the woman is for the man, not the man for the woman, but there's a balance to it. Because you wouldn't exist either if you weren't born. Amen. And you wouldn't be born if it wasn't for some woman. Uh, verse 13. Judge in, yourself, in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory unto her, or to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And so, hence comes the phrase that I learned in Little House of the Prairie, that a woman's hair is her crown of glory. But it's not her own glory, it's the glory of her man. Verse 7. Verse 16, but if, the man, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such contention, uh, custom, neither the churches of God. So if you're all upset about the exact length of some woman's hair, then we don't have anything to say. That's not the issue. It's not the technicality of the line. Um, and we'll get to that uh, as we go. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for your words. I thank you for your sacrifice of love that you made for us when you died on the cross. 
And I pray, dear God, that you fill us with your spirit this morning, that you help us to get your words, to help them get, a, get, a, get them deep down in our, soul, our hearts and souls, and help us to apply it to the way that we live our life, even looking like fools to the world. Lord, and, and let us, let us uh, embrace you and joy in those things and in the suffering and mockery that will come that comes uh, from following you knowing that our reward is uh, yet to come uh, be with us be with us today help me to get it right uh, help me to preach your word straight it's in jesus christ's name i pray amen all right now first of all the bible says in uh, verse three but i would have you know that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is of God. And that is true. And the things that he said in verse uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 are also true. And in some sense apply to all men everywhere. But here, specifically, we're talking about the church. Because the head of uh, the man is Christ. Right? Christ is the head of the church. And so man has to follow Christ. And uh, if you keep your finger here and turn to Ephesians 5. Keep your finger here and turn to Ephesians 5. And look down in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So it's true that, that uh, every man... Uh, is the head of his wife, whether he's in the church or not, saved or not, uh, according to the Bible. But here in the context, we're specifically talking about Christian men and Christian women. Because he said, uh, the head of Christ is, or the head of the man, the head of every man is Christ. Amen. And I want you to notice, second of all, that no matter what changes in the world, no matter what uh, uh, progression happens, no matter what enlightenment, no matter what growth is claimed by the age and the spirit of the air and the age, uh, what God said in the beginning hasn't changed. In Matthew chapter 19, he said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. And that's not just biology, as we read here. Here we read about authority, which has to do with your role in a marriage, with your place, with how you should behave, how you should act, and importantly, how you should appear. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. I want you to notice thirdly, that everybody has somebody over them. And that just like you, wife, have to be in submission to your husband, so you, husband, have to be in submission to Christ. So, uh, wife, you're in submission to Christ by being in submission to your husband because the words of Christ say that you should be in submission to your husband. Amen. We've gone over this before, but here in this passage, we're going to look at it from a little bit of a different point of view uh, and a little bit of a different reasoning and with a little bit of a different implications of what it means and what what you're actually saying to the universe and the angels when you decide to be in rebellion against your husband but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God right it goes God Christ Man, woman, in that order. So you can forget this God is my co-pilot uh, slogan. And you forget this marriage is a partnership slogan when it comes to authority. Because although um, it is a type of a partnership, the two partners are not equal in authority, in headship. Amen. There's one head. And it's not figurative. It is not a, it's not a figurehead. It's not just symbolic, although it is symbolic. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Uh, notice lastly with this verse that with the word, the use of the word head, 
you have any problem understanding what the word head means? You understand we're talking about authority and leadership and headship. So as we read through the rest of the passage, I want you to remember uh, that use of the word head. Head is a reference to authority and, and position in a marriage. Amen. And that's important because when you start getting into verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so forth, uh, people tend to forget that we're still talking about authority and headship from verse 3, which defined the meaning of the word for the passage. Note the hermeneutical principle of first use. Now, this isn't the first use of the word head in the Bible, but it is in the passage, and it sets the tone and the context and the meaning of the word. Headship, authority, amen? Power. Look at verse 4. Okay, so this is the principle of verse 3. That's the structure. That's the hierarchy. That's the uh, organizational chart, as you people that have been in business uh, might be familiar with. Verse 4. Every man, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Okay, so if you cover your head, you dishonor your head, man. Notice there's different rules for man for men than there are for women. Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Let's see, his head. So look at verse 4 again. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So who is who or what is the head of a man? Christ. So if you pray with your head covered, you dishonor Christ, right? Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. Now who or what is the head of every woman? Her man. So when a woman prays with her head uncovered, she dishonors her man. See? Is that clear? Is that clear enough so far? For, for that is even as all one as if she were shaven. So you might as well be shaven. You might as well shave your head off and go around bald. He says. Uh, if you... Um, have your uh, if you're uncovered if your if your head is uncovered. So notice the two uses of the word: her head uncovered. That's your literal head with hair on it. And notice the second use of the word: dishonoreth her head. So there's two uses of the word, and one is a symbol and a picture of the other. But you affect the one, the the one that's real, uh, by by what you do with the symbol. See? So it's symbolic, your hair. Pray or prophesy with your, with your head uncovered. But it's symbolic of the headship that your husband has over you. So when you decide to be in rebellion and cut it short, so that your, hair is, your head is not covered, or you don't wear a hat or something to cover your hair, to cover your head, then you dishonor not your hair, but your husband. So you see how the Bible uses the, the word in two different ways? But they're both connected. And one is a picture of the other. And one affects the other. And they both go together. And they're not divorced from one another. So if you do something with one, you're doing it with the other. See? Look at verse 6. For if the... This is why I'm always uh, make a point to call attention to the fact when a woman has short hair and looks like a lesbian. Because I want to keep the issue clear in my family and the people that hear me that that is dishonoring to her husband. If she has a husband, if she has no husband, then that's a bit 
a bigger issue, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Verse 6, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. So you might as well just, at the end of verse 5, having your head praying with your head uncovered is the same thing as if you were shaven. Just shaved head, bald. So, if you're not going to be covered, then let her also be shorn. Then cut her hair, shave it, and let her go around in shame because she has shaved hair of, of shaved hair. Make it make the issue clear. Push it to the edge. Amen. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, which it is, let her be covered. So the so if you're gonna if you're gonna go around uncovered, then let's just shave you and let you be in shame. But the answer is not to just rigidly apply legalistic things. The answer is to cover her hair. That's what we're trying to get to. Cut, keep your head covered. Amen. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Now this is important, because there's, there's two things going on here. There's a practical thing of what you do with your hair and your head, and then there's a there's a spiritual thing, there's a doctrinal thing, a real thing, uh, which is the reason why we do the practical thing with our hair. Amen? Verse 7, it's not just what's convenient for you. It's not just how you feel or what you think looks good or what you're comfortable with. This is an outward expression of what's going on in your heart towards God. See? Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. So first of all, when a man covers his head, the implication is, when he's praying or prophesying, when a man covers his head when he's praying or prophesying, the implication is, he puts something between him and God. He dishonors Jesus Christ. Verse 4. And so he ought not do that. He, uh, he covers the image and glory of God. He hides it. Uh, he covers it. Amen. And so he ought not do that. Now... It says that the man is the image and the glory of God. Now, let's look at a couple things. We know that uh, Adam was made in the image of God. Genesis, uh, keep your finger here and turn to Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 1. And look down at verse 26. And he said, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. <clears throat> but notice he created man in his own image. But he didn't create woman in his own image. He created woman in the image of the man, according to 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. And look in verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. So Seth was not made in the image of God. Seth was made in the image of Adam, and in the likeness of Adam. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. So Adam lost the image of God. Uh, 
Now, sorry, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1 through 3. So, but we read in 1 Corinthians 11, 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 11 and turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And look down in verse uh, 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Speaking of the veil um, over Israel, the veil that was uh, over Moses' face, and the blinded minds uh, of the people in the Old Testament, and even unto this day when Moses read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, that's the word of God, James chapter 1, the perfect law of liberty, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when you're born again uh, by the Spirit of God and are joined with the Spirit of Christ and are one spirit with him and are seated together in heavenly places, you, re, uh, you, you regain the, the glory of God. You're ch and then it's a process of being changed into that same image from glory to glory, from being more and more like him as you grow in Christ. Amen. Change into that same image. So, which is another reason why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 we're talking about saved men, not lost men. Because lost men don't have the glory of God, aren't made in the image of God, but are in the image of Adam. Uh, Romans chapter 5. In Adam all die, amen. But in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 11, 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as the he is the image and glory of God. So when a man covers his head when praying or prophesying, he dishonors Jesus Christ by, by hiding, by covering the image and the glory of God. Now something happens when you pray or prophesy. So when you're praying or preaching, you ought not to cover your head. Amen. I believe that includes street preaching as well. You have, to, you, have, you have to should keep your head uncovered, which includes uh, having short hair, which we'll read about in a little bit. But the woman is the glory of the man. So just like the way a man behaves, honors or dishonors God, uh, specifically Jesus Christ, uh, depending on what he does with his head when he prays or prophesies, so a woman depending on what she does with her head, honors or dishonors Jesus Christ, or honors or dishonors her man, who she is the glory of. Now, uh, so like in the Old Testament, uh, when Israel got all messed up, one of the curses that God uh, uh, put on them was, a woman shall rule them, he said, which he said is a shameful thing. All right, you're not going to obey me? Okay, you can be led around by a woman. What do you think of that? You can let some woman run you who, who's driven by her emotions, who doesn't have solidarity, who can't thrive without community and support. I'll let a woman run you. How about that? What do you think of that? That'll fix you. That'll turn you to the Lord when you've had that for a couple hundred years. For a man uh, indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. See? So you can say, you know, a woman represents the man, which she does. You could say, well, she's my proxy, and 
she uh, has the authority to, to sign my name and stand in my place and represent me if I can't be there. And that can be true if the husband so wills. But it should only be true if she can be trusted to perform the will of her husband in his absence. But notice here, that's something more, uh, that's seemingly more important. But here, a big issue is made of what she says to the angels and to the world and to the universe with her hair when she prays. Because she is the glory of the man. So when she rebels against the man, she dishonors him, her man. And she uh, says to the world that he cannot rule his own house well. Which I dare say is why many men are not in the ministry today. Because their wicked, evil, rebellious wives won't follow him. See? Because they all think they're independent and need to be treated equally. They all think they uh, are the same. They all think they can, uh, whatever a man can do, I can do better. And if I could, or if that's not true, if there's something that I'm better at, then I should be entrusted with it. It has nothing to do with what you're good at. It has to do with the way that God said things are. And you dishonor your man when you pray with your head covered, uncovered, woman, because you are the glory of the man. Now look at verse 8. For the man is not of the woman but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So there's two things. The woman was um, formed by uh, God taking a rib out of Adam and using it to form a woman. So the woman came from, from a man, not a man from a woman. So that is a reason why she's not in charge. And secondly, uh, the man was not created for the, the reason why he was created was not for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. She is there to be a help meet for him. He is not there to be a help meet for her. For the woman is not of the woman, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And notice that after 4,000 years since Adam and Eve were made, the Holy Spirit is saying that no matter what has changed in the world, this has not changed as far as you're concerned, Christian. Maybe this, is how, how, this isn't how you were uh, as a lost person. This isn't how you grew up. This is what your mother taught you. This isn't what you learned in you know, rebellion school where you went to college. But this is, the Holy, this is what the Holy Spirit says, what the Bible says. And this is the instruction that he gives for Christians in the church by the apostle to the Gentiles, who is our example, who we're supposed to follow, verse 1. Even as I also am of Christ, he says. All right, now, when you don't do that, remember, the woman is the glory of the man, and, uh, and the man is the image and the glory of God. When you don't do that, keep your finger here and turn to Romans 1. So when you, when you, woman, when you pray with your head uncovered, when you pray or prophesy with your head uncovered, you show the image, you dishonor uh, your man, and you show the image and the glory uh, of the man, not the image and the glory of God. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and look down in verse... Uh, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them.
for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, notice power and Godhead, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, get this now, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, 7, is the man, into an image made like the corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So, woman, when you, when you pray with your head uncovered, you glorify the man, uh, not God. So you ought to cover your head when you're praying so that God is glorified. Uh, not the man. And when you do that, you put yourself right in Romans 1.23. Change the image uh, of the uncorruptible God into an image, the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man, into birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. That's what you do when you cut your hair short. All right, now verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So, what's the head of the woman? The man. So if the head of the woman is the man, then the implication here is that when you pray with your head uncovered, you have short hair or no hair, or you pray without a covering of some kind, which can either be your hair, long hair, or a hat, you, you remove the power from your head. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, what is that all about? The idea is that angels uh, are watching. That there are angels uh, in the world. That there are angels in the universe. And they can all see. They're all, we talked before about your conversation and, and how... Your conversation is beheld by all of heaven and earth. And everybody knows how, you, how you're acting and how you behave and the things that you say and do. And all your little secret manipulations that you do behind the scenes. But in particular, angels see you being in subjection to your husband or not. For this cause of the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now her head is her husband. So we're talking about two things. We're talking about hair. I keep thinking of Samson and his power with, with his hair. For this cause of the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. We're talking about her hair, which is a type, a picture, a representation of what's going on in her heart towards God in respect to whether or not she's submitted to her husband. So when she has short hair, it seems to me I could be wrong, but she says to the angels, there's no power on my head, come and get it. See? Say, what are you talking about? Come and get it. All right, let's look at some stuff. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11. We're talking about Adam and Eve here, right? 2 Corinthians 11, and look down in verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Verse 1. For, this is 2 Corinthians 11. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now notice in verse 2, we're talking about a sexual relationship between a husband and his wife. 
for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So he says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, right after talking about husband and wife and presenting you as a chaste virgin, verse 2. Meaning that if, if uh, just like Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now here in verse 3, we're talking about your mind. But there's something with the beginning of verse 3, serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, that's connected to verse 2, espouse you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. See? So there's that. All right, turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And look down in verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So verse 4, angels that sinned, happens immediately prior to the to Noah's flood verse 5 right so the angels that sin in second peter 4 turn to genesis chapter 6 genesis chapter 6 and look in verse 1 and it came to pass uh when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took upon them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men. And they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and gr grieved him at his heart. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the angels that sinned in Second Peter 2, are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2 and 4. 2, 3, and 4. Right? What other angels do you read about in Genesis chapter 6 immediately prior to the flood? Now notice uh, a couple things. Notice in Genesis chapter 6 the context in, in how they sinned. Verse 2, sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took upon them wives of all which they chose. So they saw the daughters of men and just took, the, took whichever they chose of them. And then from them came a race of giants, verse 4. All right. But notice the... Notice how that happened. Uh, turn to Jude chapter 6. Jude 6. And verse 5. I will therefore put in your remembrance, so you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. 
and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So we get more information about these angels that sinned in Second Peter uh, 2. They sinned by um, taking wives of men, and they sinned by leaving their first estate. They didn't stay where God put them, which obviously included not mating with women. But left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. All right, now turn to First Peter, First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, and look down in verse uh, eighteen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God weighed in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few that his eight souls were saved. And then look down in chapter 4 and verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, uh, but live according to God in the Spirit. So there's two categories of people in prison that were preached to. It was these men in verse 6. And then there was also these spirits in verse uh, uh, 19 and 20 which were sometimes disobedient while God waited in the days of Noah. So again, what other angels or spirits uh, are we talking about here other than the ones that were mentioned in the passage in Genesis chapter 6? Amen. So in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The implication is, all right, look, uh, angels have power. They're more powerful than you are. Keep your finger here and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 again. 2 Peter chapter 2 and look down at verse 11. Wherein, whereas angels, actually start in verse 10, but uh, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Notice the similarity to the, to the book of Jude. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. See? So, government, uh, dignities, are spiritual beings that angels uh, won't even bring railing accusations against them before the Lord, but instead they say the Lord rebuke thee, like Michael the archangel. But notice that angels have power, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, than who? Than you. Than these brute beasts uh, who speak evil of dignities and shoot their mouth off about stuff they don't understand. First Corinthians uh, 11 and verse 10. So angels have power. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So angels have power. And because the woman is for the man, is represented by the, it represents the man, uh, is of the man, created for the man, and the man is her head, she ought to have power on her head because of the angels. Because the angels have power. 
So her head is her man. So her man ought to have power with her. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angel. So it has to do with the relationship between a man and a woman and the power that the man has over her and the power that is represented symbolically by the length of her hair. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the wom woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Uh, verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely for a woman to pray to God uncovered? Pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, is ashamed unto him? It's just not natural for a man to have long hair. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So you you don't necessarily need a hat uh, like the holiness women in Church of God, Pentecostal, the furnace. All those people you know go around with hats on all the time because of this verse or this passage, uh, because verse 15 says that your hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom near the churches of God. So if you're going to get all uptight about the and be contentious about the exact length, must be 16 inches from here, you know, we, we have nothing to say. That's not what we're saying. There's no custom that specifies the exact length. It's the principle of you ought to, your hair ought to cover your neck, which is the Bible definition. Um, or you could wear a hat when you pray or prophesy. But you ought to have long hair, not short hair, verse 15, woman. And the reason why is because you dishonor your man when you have short hair. Because you glorify, you, you do two things. You dishonor your man, and you dishonor him by changing the glory of God into an image made like the corruptible man, Romans 1.23. And you make yourself susceptible to this deal with the angels. And so, uh, I don't know, I don't understand the depth of that. I... Uh, that is my belief that somehow um, whether or not you're in submission to your husband makes you more or less open uh, spiritually to this uh, thing that happened with the angels in Genesis 6. Um, so you ought to stay in subjection to your husband because there is a place of safety where your husband has power to protect you. Beyond just the obvious, his being under his authority protects you. So like when you're out in the world and you're crossing the street by yourself, you go on ahead, you're five or six feet ahead of your husband, your husband has stopped because you're not paying attention and you want to give him a thousand questions of why you should stop and consider it and make, and make, make it and feel like you contributed to the decision and in the meantime, the car runs you over. I remember when I was a boy, uh, my dad and I were stacking wood in the basement. We used to heat our house with wood in the winter. So it was a whole process of cutting down trees, uh, cutting them in, cutting the trunk into pieces, um, cutting it, splitting it, stacking it, hauling it, cutting it, repeat, cut, stick, splat, haul. And um, we were down in the basement and he said, he told me to do something, and I was like, well, why do I want to do it that way? And he said, Jeff, one day, someone's going to ask, tell you to duck, and a bullet's going to go through your skull because you didn't follow. You need to learn to follow orders. Amen. So I just say that as an illustration and an example of how the authority that a man has over a woman protects her, and how when she doesn't follow it, no matter what she thinks and esteems of herself and her opinion and her decisions and her awareness, no matter what she thinks, 
she diminishes that power that her husband has to protect her, in this case from the angels, when she uh, rebels against him. Which can be by having short hair. You cut, and you can be rebellious and still have long hair. Don't get me wrong. Amen. <laughs> Plenty of rebellious women with long hair. But uh, what this passage is indicating is the attitude of your heart towards God in being in submission to your husband and how that, uh, in a practical way in which that should be displayed with the length of your hair. Now, you can make your hair long and still re be rebellious. So let your adornment be the inner man of the heart, as it says in Peter, not with braided hair or pearls. But by the same token, when you pray or prophesy, you say to the angels, you, you announce to them, I'm in rebellion against my husband. And beyond that, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm pretty sure, I, I believe what I preached to you today. Uh, but when it comes to this thing about, I certainly believe the angels are watching. I certainly believe that they're standing around looking. And that every time a woman, and particularly they're looking at women, Genesis 6. And then we get into pictures of that in the world with vampires and such who who are attracted to a woman's neck and other things that are connected to it like blood uh, which I won't we won't go down that rabbit hole but uh, this morning but these are all things that are related suffice it to say this morning if a woman have long hair is a glory to her her hair is given to her for a covering but if you have short hair, woman, then it's a shame. And it's the opposite for men because there are different rules for men and women. Because men are not women and women are not men. And in the beginning, God made them male and female. Amen? All right, that's enough for this morning. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ and his blood. I thank you for your words. I thank you for this instruction. Help us to follow it. Help us to do right by it. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.